Okay. Um, I think in the interest of time, I think we will go ahead and get started. And again, I want to thank um, uh, Dr. Fernandez Ferra, as well as Dominic Guerra for agreeing to uh, join us for Journal Club. Um, and also in advance, thank uh, Dr. Margie Brandwine Weber um, for her participation as a discussant. The topic of um, extra thyroidal extension, while some individuals um, might think this went away when the AJC um, decided not to include it um, in terms of minimal extra thyroidal extension as part of um, the contemporary staging paradigm. Um, it is extremely important um, uh, for two reasons. One, uh, minimal extra thyroidal extension, which will be the primary topic I am in discussion here is considered one of the additional variables that the AJCC listed as additional considerations for risk stratification. And it does come into play in uh, the ATA risk of recurrence um, stratification. And so understanding what your pathologist is um, reporting, understanding some of the vari inherent variability that might be at play when it is recorded, um, on your pathology report is extremely important. So with that, um, let me turn this over to uh, to Juan and to Dominic. And um, once again, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Erkin. Um, so I'm Dominic Guerrero. I'm here with uh, Dr. Juan hernandez Pereira at Moffitt Cancer Center. Um, and we're going to be talking about uh, the topic that Dr. Erkin mentioned. You can see the article here, um, Inter-Observer Variability in the Histopathologic Assessment of extrathyroidal extension of well-differentiated thyroid carcinoma supports the new AJCC cancer uh, eighth edition criteria for tumor staging. Um, and this was published in Thyroid uh, in 2019. So just the first thing I want to mention as we get started um, is central to the topic. And um, the eighth edition that's, that's mentioned in the title of this article, I'm comparing it here to the seventh edition. You can see the seventh at the top and the eighth at the bottom. These are um, the CAP guidelines for uh, T-staging that are based on the AJCC criteria. <clears throat> so I want to highlight mainly the T3 area. And you can see at the top that in the based on the seventh edition, minimal extrathyroidal extension or microscopic was enough to bump up a tumor to a T3. And then with the change, <clears throat> to get to a T3, you need gross extrathyroidal extension. Um, so invading invading the strap muscles, which are listed here from a tumor of any size. <clears throat> so that's a big difference because with the eighth edition criteria, um, if you have minimal or microscopic extrathyroidal extension, it won't bring you up to a T3. So why did this change occur? There are, there are numerous reasons. It was based on numerous reasons. Um, included, included among those are the embryology of the thyroid, which is unique to the gland, <clears throat> anatomic and histologic considerations, um, gross assessment, which can vary from one prosector to another, and of course, evidence in the literature. <clears throat> so starting with the embryology of the thyroid. Um, the thyroid gland has a somewhat complicated uh, embryology, and you can see the path it takes here is not simple per se. It starts with the foramen cecum of the tongue, travels through the thyroglossal duct, um, is intimate with the anterior portion of the hyoid bone, <clears throat> and then continues on down to rest at its final destination, anterior to the trachea. Um, there are variations in how the thyroid gland is structured from one patient to another. Um, some don't have an isthmus at all. Some have a pyramidal lobe, as you can see here, um, which is a remnant of the thyroglossal duct. Um, there's also a structure which goes by numerous names, including the muscle of Sommerin, and uh, that is attached to the hyoid bone and to the isthmus. <clears throat> and the isthmus also is pretty complicated um, because it intermingles more with the surrounding soft tissue structures, and I'll show you a little bit about that. <clears throat> This is just very quickly the anatomy of the anterior neck, um, mainly on the muscles. But you can see the thyroid gland here, anterior to the trachea. Um, right in front of it, you have the sternothyroid muscle and then the other strap muscles surrounding. This is um, normal thyroid histology, but it's actually a little complicated. Um, on the left, you can see adipose tissue or what looks like adipose tissue inside of the, uh, the thyroid parenchyma. And that's challenging because when trying to assess extrathyroidal extension, if you see a tumor invading into adipose tissue, 
you have to question, is that adipose, adipose tissue that was outside of the thyroid or is it something that was within? And then on the right, as I had just mentioned a couple slides ago, you see the, in the isthmus, there really is a commingling of the thyroid uh, gland and the surrounding skeletal muscle and soft tissue. Um, and another thing I'd like to mention at this point is that the thyroid gland <clears throat> does not have a true capsule, which makes things even more complicated when trying to determine what's inside of it and outside. So this is showing extra thyroidal extension, and this is coming to the variability that comes into play at the gross aspect of, of this entity. And at the bottom, you can see this is, this is also from the article. <clears throat> um, you have a thyroid gland normal on the right lobe, which is to the left in this picture. And then on the left side of the thyroid, um, it's abnormal. And you can see that the tumor extends into the surrounding tissue. And here at the far right, it looks like there's skeletal muscle. And you can see that the tumor invades into these structures. So right here, you have potential for variability from how one person handles this to another because the pathologist needs to take sections from this area on the right if they hope to see what's on the top left, which is the what is, as you can see on the top right, papillary thyroid carcinoma, um, extending down through the skeletal muscle. <clears throat> and then the other reason, uh, the fourth that we mentioned, is uh, the literature. Um, so. This article um, was, is reviewed in the article we're discussing, and it was led actually by Dr. Mark Erkin and a team of uh, expert head and neck and endocrine pathologists. And this was published in Thyroid in 2016, looking at inter-observer variation uh, in the pathologic identification of exactly what we're talking about, uh, minimal extrathyroidal extension in PTC. So there were 11 expert pathologists. They were from the US, Italy, and Canada. They had 69 scan slides, um, and these were representative permanent sections of papillary thyroid carcinoma from Mount Sinai, Beth Israel in New York. Um, each slide represented one case, so one slide per case. <clears throat> and the cases were selected on the basis of availability, availability at the time of study. <clears throat> the slides and the cases were specifically chosen for potential controversy with minimal extrathyroidal extension. And that was determined by the lead pathologist at the time. They, are, they were h and &E stained, digitally scanned, and all 11 pathologists evaluated all cases. The 11 pathologists each, for each case, designated them as either having or lacking minimally, uh, minimal extent, uh, extrathyroidal extension. And that was based on perithyroidal involvement of, among others, but fat, skeletal muscle, nerves, and thick-walled vascular structures. The pathologists were aware that any nerve involvement seen was not the recurrent laryngeal nerve, and that it was necessary to inform them of that because involvement of the recurrent laryngeal nerve, as you know, would have bumped it up to a T4. The criteria that each pathologist used was recorded, and the pathologists were informed of the study's purpose in advance. So this is from uh, their results, <clears throat> and you can see they listed the 11 pathologists from left to right at the top, and then these columns represent how they determined or the criteria they used for uh, minimal extrathyroidal extension. Uh, and Y obviously representing a yes and N a no. And you can see that there was some variability between the pathologists. Um, uh, interestingly, actually, these two pathologists were the strictest and they only used uh, skeletal muscle involvement while there was a degree of variability with the other pathologists, whether they used fat uh, involvement, nerve, or thick-walled vessel. Um, so these two seem to have stricter criteria. This other category is the other criteria that each pathologist used uh, to help assist them in determining if there was histologic minimal extrathyroidal extension or not. So for example, some used a uh, desmoplastic reactive response. Others used the plane of the thyroid edge to try to help them decide if it was outside or inside. Um, and again, the strictest two pathologists actually did not have additional criteria. So they stuck to the skeletal muscle involvement. Um, and then at the bottom, this is listing whether they used different criteria when they were looking at the isthmus. And that's because of the embryology and the, the, the structure, normal anatomy of the isthmus that we discussed earlier. Um, and you can see that some of them did use uh, stricter criteria, while others did not use any additional criteria. And interestingly, again, the same two pathologists who were strictest um, at that point, not, not even skeletal muscle invasion, was enough for ETE. Um, these are the results looking at the kappa coefficient for the study. And you can see on the right how to uh, interpret the kappa coefficient. Um, but basically, you can see that the overall agreement for presence of ETE, minimal ETE, 
uh, was very low. Um, and if you look at the individual criteria, they were also pretty low, although skeletal muscle involvement was notably a little bit higher uh, in agreement than as compared to the others. Um, here on the left is the exact same thing I just showed you on the last slide. And then on the right, um, this is the same calculation, but done with only nine of the pathologists. So just to see how it would compare with those two stricter pathologists removed. And there was a little bit of increased uh, agreement, but overall still very low. It was only a tiny change. So how about extranodal extension? That's another um, part of the, the study that we're looking at that was reviewed. Um, and they looked at this um, this study, which was also led by Dr. Markirk and, and the same team, uh, looking at inter-observer variation and in the pathological identification of e, &E. Um, So that was also published in thyroid in 2016. The reason why that's important is because, as you know, lymph node metastases are very common in PTC. Um, up to 40 to 50% of cases have metastases at the initial time of diagnosis. And within those lymph nodes that are positive, the reported rates of e, &E range from 22% to 45%. Um, e, e is a strong and independent predictor of disease recurrence, distant metastasis, and disease-specific survival. So, you know, at the bottom, again, it was the, very similar to the previous study. Um, and you can see that the uh, there were 61 cases as opposed to 69, but otherwise it was very similar. Um, and at the top, these are their results. So looking at the kappa coefficient, you can see that it was actually significantly higher than with ETE. Um, and that's probably for various reasons, but one I'd like to mention right now is the fact that most lymph nodes have a true capsule, uh, while the thyroid gland, again, does not. So that may, ha that may help with the subjectivity that comes into play when trying to uh, make this assessment. So in summary, um, microscopic identification of ETE is subjective, um, particularly from the consideration of only adipose tissue, vasculature, and nerves rather than skeletal muscle. And the complexity is in part due to the unique histologic, anatomic, and developmental properties of the thyroid. And they concluded by supporting the eighth edition criteria and saying that the relatively strict criteria um, is appropriate. It may decrease inter-observer variability um, and there may be greater consistency in diagnosis and staging of thyroid carcinoma. Um, and at this point, I'd like to turn over to Dr. Uh, Juan hernandez Pereira for a few more slides. Okay, thank you, Dominic. So, so now with this change, the question is, how does this has affected reporting of thyroid cancer in our daily practice as pathologists? And at least in my view, there are three things that are important with this change. First, some people have felt that the, it has been a relief because we know there's some interserve variability and some pathologists felt, okay, now I don't have to worry so much about this. However, we'll, as we're going to see, that's not the case. Another thing important is that I think this change has increased the need of enhancing communication between surgeons and pathologists, especially to determine what is macroscopic extrathyroid extension, and somehow created a disconnect with the current ATA guidelines. And I'm going to show you some examples of this. So before the eighth edition of the AJC staging system, this was the CAP reporting protocol for thyroid, where only mentioned that extrathyroid extension should be classified as present or not, and within present, minimal and extensive. After the change, they remove completely minimal extrathyroid extension from the from the required reporting. Um, elements and they just mentioned present and just refer to the one that has both clinical and macroscopic as well as microscopic. So somehow they just limited it to gross extrathyroid extension and left actually minimal extrathyroid extension from the um, reporting protocol. The problem is this, for example, this is a case I just have yesterday. This is a 1.2 centimeter nodule uh, it's not present in the isthmus, it's a papillary thyroid carcinoma, and from this portion you can also start appreciating that it has an infiltrative growth pattern at the periphery. In this area, it's already starting to intermingle between sizable vasculature structure as well as adipose tissue. And there's an area where you can see this rim of cauterized skeletal muscle, and the tumor is actually going into 
uh, that skeletal muscle, a lectin desmoplastic reaction, as well as a heavy lymphocytic infiltration. So in these cases now, the question that arises are three. First, is this histological evidence of extrathoral extension? If yes, is this macroscopic or microscopic extrathoral extension, and how should I report it? So, uh, for example, in a case like this, to me, this is evidence that there's histological events of extrathoral extension. The question now is, is this micro or this is macro? And this is where enhancing the communication with the surgeons it has become critical because the only way for us as pathologists when seeing this in the slide is actually ask, asking the, th the surgeons, what did you see during time of surgery? And in most of cases, when I see this picture on the slides, I actually go to the OR report to see if it was documented if the extrathoral extension was clinically evident at time of surgery. If the surgeon mentioned that in his or her pathology report, then to me, this is a T3. If it's not, then I will just go by the size of the tumor. In this case, it will be a T1B. An important part is this disconnect with the ATA guidelines um, that has created this risk certification schema in which minimal extrathoral extension still creates a tumor into an intermediate uh, risk category, uh, for which in many institutions, these are patients that probably will need to receive radioactive iodine depending on the threshold that each uh, individual endocrinologist have. So that definitely had uh, an impact in how we are reporting that because for some time we were actually not capturing that in the CFP cancer protocols and that actually led to a change in the edition in 2018 which actually a microscopic extrathoral extension into the strap muscle were actually incorporated again as one of the reporting parameters that we need to record at time of um, reporting a thyroid cancer in order to give that clinical information to our endocrinologist that there is actually a microscopic um, extrathoral extension and therefore a tumor that otherwise will be classified as a low risk tumor is now an intermediate risk um, in the intermediate risk category. So with that, um, I don't know if you have any other questions. If not, we can move forward with Dr. Brandwein's presentation. Okay, terrific. I think uh, we'll save questions and comments till the end here. Um, Margie, do you want to? I, I have just one question, Juan, in order to um, try to clarify. Is, is the problem of commingling of muscle only an issue in the isthmus, or is it um, true on the, um, in the, lobe, the lateral lobes as well? Primarily, yes, but you can also see skeletal muscle commingling out in the in the lobes too. But where we have the most the, the, the most common problem is in the isthmus. So I've seen muscle in the lateral aspects too, but in the isthmus, that's where it occurs more commonly. And the other problem that sometimes we have, especially in the setting of chronic lymphocytic thyroiditis, those thyroids are already abnormal somehow. And in those cases also the in the assessment of extrathoral extension can be difficult too. So just to clarify, um, your communication with the surgeon um, is uh, to identify whether um, grossly there was involvement of the strap muscles um, at the time of surgery or, um, or involvement of uh, perhaps esophageal musculature. Um, is, is that is that where you're trying to get um, further um, surgical clarification? My the, typically the clarification I want to know if there was a time of surgery in, involvement of the strap muscles if they felt that clinically it was already outside the thyroid uh, within and, the strap um, muscles. Okay, and is that a criteria in that will change what you're reporting histologically or is this an addendum how do you how do that you will, incorporate that will change how i report the extrathoral extension if i get the feedback that it was not that they don't felt it was outside then i will report it as minimal extrathoral extension if i get the feedback I that yes i felt that, oh yes it was outside then i will call it macroscopic extrathoral extension and then put the patient in a t3b category i see 
Okay. But this is always a communication I have with them. Every time I see this uh, picture similar to what I, I, I show you, the first thing I do, I open my the, um, the operative report. We actually have tried to ask them, can you put that in your in your like highlight in your OR report if you if you find or not? Some are better than other ones. Otherwise, I have to go through the entire text to see if they felt it was outside or not. Great. All right. Terrific. Thank you, um, Margie. Uh, let me let me have you go ahead here. Okay. So as we've heard, um, in the seventh AJCC, the definition of PT3 was extension to the sternohyoid strap muscle or perithyroid soft tissue. To put this into a historical context, in the first five editions of the AJCC, PT4 was defined as a, for a PTC as a, as a PTC of any size with extension beyond the capsule. That was it for guidance. In the sixth edition is when we actually see the debut of gross ETE as determined by the surgeon making it a PT4 versus a PT3, which is any PTC with minimal or microscopic ETE. Can you advance, please? Oh, uh, can, can, oh great, okay. So um, now in the eighth AJCC, PT3, as you've heard, is defined as grossly evident involve, involvement of the strap muscles at the time of surgery or gross examination. Um, one question is, is this purely within the gross realm? What if there's multifocal microscopic ETE that's not appreciated grossly? And we'll come back to that. Next, please. So the impact of microscopic ETE on overall survival, disease-specific survival, is nil. When it comes to um, recurrent disease, um, it's a controversial topic. Now, let's keep in mind that the AJCC predicts disease-specific survival, not risk of recurrence. That's what the ATA ROR does. Uh, according to the seventh AJCC, a PT3 would um, render a tumor stage three. And um, if you look, and please point all the way to the right, this is, um, this is just some old data, and look at the right arrow. The right arrow are um, and tumors from P from T1 to T3 um, as they as um, by survival by disease specific survival and so, so stage three tumors are not associated with significant mortality um, but as I say uh, they they are uh, it's part of the features that we evaluate for ATA ROR and it has been associated with a three to nine percent risk of um, recurrence. Um, many authors will conclude that microscopic ETE is not an independent prognosticator of recurrence, persistence, or disease-specific survival. By concluding that it's not an independent prognosticator, it, it means after adjust, adjustment for confounders. So it's also not a strong prognosticator, but that doesn't mean it's not a prognosticator. Um, I want to draw your attention to the right lower screen. Um, this is from a study that we're going to get back to. This is from and um, this is from uh, the Mayo Clinic, and uh, this is thousands, over 3,000 patients. And here what we're seeing is, again, a cumulative um, mort mortality, disease-specific mortality. And on the left-hand side, the, the Kaplan-Meier with the round dots, on the left side, this is for gross ETE. And on the far right, you have the mortal mortality as determined by um, no uh, microscopic ETE, and that's in, um, that is the squares, and all the way in the bottom by the rectangles, that's microscopic ETE, again, with respect to mortality. Now, I haven't found much in the literature regarding the, the subquantification or subclassification of microscopic ETE. This is one study I found. It's an excellent study from Memorial, and the, uh, Michael Rivera was the first author. This was in uh, 2010. And in the bottom red rectangle, they say no survival difference between focal and established microscopic ETE. So they defined focal microscopic as less two or fewer foci, less than one millimeter away versus established, that's that was their 
terminology for more than two foci less than one millimeter away. Okay, please, um, please advance. Okay, so this is the study um, that we were reviewing for Sue et al. Um, and as you heard, 11 readers uh, uh, evaluating 69 digitalized slides, evaluating for MT, microscopic ETE, according to their own personal definitions. And so, as you've seen before, these are the 11 reviewers, these are the features that they've looked at, and you can see right away um, six and nine, reviewers six and nine, are outliers. In this study, the overall agreement for recognition of microscopic ETE was, as you heard, um, 0.14, um, which is slight agreement. Next, please. So, before um, you lose all hope with any reporting of MT, microscopic ETE, let's look at the, uh, the limitations of this study. Here you see um, the kappa value again with the two outliers removed. And as you heard before, there is a slight elevation in the kappa value, but at the agreement, it's not statistically significant and the agreement still uh, is fair or slight. Now, I draw your attention to the proportion of observed agreement. Um, which is which is different and of course much higher. So what's the difference between proportion of observed agreement and kappa values? Well, the, you see in the bottom, uh, kappa is p observed minus p expected over one minus p. So kappa value considers the possibility of chance agreements um, that that if you have 11 observers, you have 69 slides, how many times would they just agree by chance? The kappa value is affected by low number of events. And this was one of the limitations that was, um, that was uh, offered uh, in this article. Um, the frequency of microscopic ETE in the 69 cases was not disclosed, but it, it was hinted at that it was lower than what you would normally expect. So what would you normally expect? Well, here in a study that we're working on now, we haven't published it yet, um, we had over 70% of almost 400 PTCs had at, had at least some degree of microscopic ETE. So um, maybe other people would look at it and they wouldn't come up with 71.5%. Maybe they'd come up with um, uh, 65%. Maybe they'd come up with 75%. But you know, it's a, it's a fair percentage. So, um, so one of the limitations is flawed study design in that the it, uh, most likely the um, incidence of microscopic ETE in the 69 cases was not did not replicate what was normally seen. Um, the reviewers understood that all of these cases were, select, were selected for ambiguity and complexity, as we heard before. Um, only one slide per case was offered, and so there's no overall context. And so again, that has that does not at all um, replicate how a pathologist will actually grade cases. We need context, we need many slides. Um, and um, one another limitation that was offered up by the authors is perhaps perceived uh, peer pressure uh, impacted the calls. Um, next, please. So they talk about the anatomic variations which complicate the evaluation of ETE, and this is all very true. Potential for the intimate relationship between muscle fibers and the isthmus, very true. Uh, and other issues that make it not easy. Um, no complete capsule, a pseudocapsule, um, intrathyroid adipose tissue, intrathyroid large vessels, and the list goes on. Um, there's extrathyroid thyroid tissue. Uh, so anything in italics is just stuff that I added on. You know, and that's something that I don't even begin to discuss in um, a board because if, uh, if Terry Davies heard me talk about extra thyroid thyroid, he'd say to me, isn't that malignant? And I'd say, no, it's something that we see. What about pushing uh, invasion versus uh, like more aggressive type of invasion? What about uh, bad sections? So there's no question that there's, there are limitations in evaluating uh, microscopic ETE. Next slide, please. Okay, this is just to show you an example. The, the um, border, this is the deep border of the thyroid, can be kind of lobulated. And here we see um, fibrous connective tissue um, 
going into the cat into the segments of the thyroid and there's the large vessel really towards the end next please okay um so what what are some of the problems well as you've heard desmoplasia will commonly obliterate perithyroid fat next please next so if you do see carcinoma within the fat that's a very easy call but what if the obliter what if that interface is obliterated by scar tissue and that's very common um so what do you do then okay next please so um you've heard about looking for the edge of the thyroid and that wasn't really um uh, expanded upon but um this is what we do we look for anatomic boundaries to what we think are the limits of the thyroid and we use that to um call whether or not something is microscopic extra thyroid next slide okay so here this blue line is showing you um that sort of scalloped edge of the thyroid and i draw that line because i'm guided by the large obviously extra thyroid large vessels and so in making that kind of boundary, you can see, can you point all the way to the right, please, the uh, arrow. So, so you, there's a mushroom towards the, uh, all the way to the right side of the screen that crosses that boundary. So I think that's a pretty clear uh, example of microscopic extrathyroid um, invasion. Next, please. Uh, next, please. Okay, um, here we have uh, an example of a large vessel. Uh, if you see at the top of the screen, there's some there's some parathyroid tissue. That's not intrathyroid parathyroid. That's extrathyroid parathyroid. And the large vessel is outside the thyroid. Um, there's carcinoma in the bottom part of the screen, and that carcinoma is wrapping around the vessel. Next, please. Okay. Next slide. Here you see higher power of the same area, and um, the vessel is in the bottom left of the screen, and right above the vessel, that's infiltrating carcinoma. So if I can say that a vessel is definitely outside the thyroid, and if I see um, carcinoma that's on the other side of the thyroid, so that's that's fairly strict um, uh, criteria, then I can say uh, with um, uh, with assurance that this is microscopic ETE. Next, please. Next, please. Okay. Uh, this is strap muscle. Um, infiltration into, into muscle is very clear cut. Um, here what we see uh, is multifocal microscopic PTC um, going into a strap muscle. Now, this is one area of concern because it's obviously microscopic ETE, well, what if the surgeon doesn't recognize this as gross, it grossly? So what do you do in such a circumstance? So that's a problem we're left with. Okay, next, please. So um, in the Turk article, they conclude that this, the relatively strict criteria for ETE in the 8th AJCC are appropriate given inter-observer variability. So I can't agree with that statement because the um, lack of concordance for microscopic ETE is not the justification for changing the, the grading system. The lack of association with disease-specific mortality is the reason for dropping it. Um, dropping microscopic ETE sort of solves the inter-observer variability for the AJCP, but not for the ATA. It does, of course, call into question many studies that have examined the impact of ET ETE. However, bear in mind that the, you can't really use um, the SUE study as a, a, you know, for comparison with this very low variability, with this very low concordance rate, because the SUE study does not really replicate what happens in real life among pathologists. Now, the Turk study would be a stronger manuscript if it offered specific guidance for evaluating for evaluating microscopic ETE because it's still necessary. Now, um, the authors write in the in the introduction, notably neither AJCC nor CAP offers guidance 
if multifocal extensive uh, microscopic ETE is not recognized grossly. But the article also doesn't offer guidance on that. Next, please. So, so where does it leave us? Should microscopic ETE go away from the ATA? Well, this is still a very controversial topic. Now, let's look at the Hay article that I said I would discuss. And this was um, a really very fine article um, from, ninth, from uh, 2016 from the Mayo Clinic. Um, and I'll, I'll read the title of it. Microscopic extra thyroid extension in papillary thyroid carcinoma does not result in rates of either cause-specific mortality or post-op tumor occurrence. So that's already telling you their point of view, where they're coming from. But now let's look at the data, okay? And there was thousands of patients in this study. So now when they look in the subgroup of M0 PTC with any N, and they looked at um, the impact of gross versus microscopic versus no ETE, the local regional recurrence rates at 10 and 20. And if you look at microscopic ETE local regional recurrence rates, it really is in between no ETE and gross ETE. Um, now, the rate of their calls for microscopic ETE were extremely low. So there were uh, 3,432 patients, as it's part of the study, and they only, they called 126 of those patients microscopic ETE. So that's less than 4%, okay? I just showed you our data, which is like over 70%. Here, in, in um, thousands of patients with a, from an institution with a different mindset, they have a rate of calling microscopic ETE is of four percent, so that is a big disconnect. Now, they um, they base their title right, no impact on um, postoperative tumor recurrence, based on this further subgroup, which is N zero, and here they conclude no difference between local regional recurrence, but with M to ETE of forty four patients versus no ETE, almost two thousand patients. Again, it, the numbers are, are, are quite off. So um, it's a very good study, um, and it looks like a massive undertaking, but we should analyze it critically before basing all of our conclusions on it. Um, here's another study, um, 2011 Memorial. Um, they looked at over a thousand, almost a thousand patients who were clinically T1, T2, N0, who um, were then upstaged pathologically to T3, that was in seventh. Um, so there were 115 patients who had microscopic ETE in this clinically low risk group. And in this group, they found uh, no impact uh, on, on recurrence free survival. But in terms of the cons for keeping um, microscopic ETE, there are associations that show, there are so significant associations with more aggressive features. Although it may not hold up in multivariate analysis, as a single variable, it has its, its impact. Um, as you heard before, microscopic ETE is associated with extranodal extension. Um, in the group that we're studying now, we haven't published this yet, we find um, microscopic ETE associated with positive lymph nodes. Now you could say, what's the big deal? Positive lymph nodes includes a range of of significance, but we also find a significant association with the group that's uh, classified as aggressive lymph node classification. We also find that microscopic ETE as substratified um, does a, is significantly associated with tall cell variant of PTC. So um, I don't think that the data supports microscopic ETE going away, um, but it, it didn't go away from the AJCC based on the lack of concordance. It went away from the AJCC based on its lack of uh, association with disease-specific survival. And that's all I have. Great. Um, Margie, thank you. I thought that uh, that was excellent. Juan um, and, and Dominic, um, do you want to comment on Dr. Bramwine's discussion here? Yeah, I completely agree with what she has said that we are the ATA guidelines and the AJC guidelines just have two different approaches. One is mortality, the other one is risk of recurrence. And we know 
that's the main problem with papillary thyroid cancer. It's not most of patients have an incredible survival. The problem is their local recurrence. And this is something where taking this out, as I was mentioning before, from especially from the reporting protocol, I think can create some problems because this is information that especially our clinical endocrinologists need to know in order to stratify these patients correctly. Um, uh, and we still definitely need more data. That's a question. Another thing that she mentioned is the extent of the mi in microscopic invasion. There are ones that you see one area. There are other ones that you see a lot of microscopic invasion. That has never been cl uh, clarified, too. So um, I I'm sure there's more stuff to, that need to be added, especially in terms of risk of recurrence, not in risk of, of mortality. Great. So I, I have a couple of questions, and I would encourage anyone uh, who does have questions just to write them in on the right side here. So I'm not sure if I'm supposed to feel better or worse as a result of this when I'm trying to interpret <laughs> a pathology report. Um, I'm still left to try to understand whether or not what is being reported by my pathologist, and I do obviously have the benefit of Dr. Bramwine being that person at this time, but um, I don't know if that pathologist interpretation is concordant with, with studies and um, that reflect minimal ETE and its importance. And so I, I think this comes back to the question, number one, does this enhance the degree of concordance and, um, and amongst pathologists. And, and I think an important thing is, what do clinicians at their individual hospitals need to know in terms of what they're asking their pathologists about a pathology report that reflects the presence or absence of, of minimal ETE? Either one or or more. Uh, I, I don't know. Um, in terms of of reporting, as I mentioned to to before, this change for us have mean that we have to talk more with our surgeons uh, because we're still seeing it on the on the slides. We see that the thyroid cancer is going out, but from a, a slide glass, you cannot make the determination if that's actually microscopic or clinically evident as described in the AJC C or it's just microscopic, which will change the, the risk stratification. So that's the reason like every time I see that, the first thing I go into the R note. If I don't see that information there, then I actually call them, look, I'm reviewing this thyroid. I see a lot of thyroid, like cancer going outside actually into surrounding muscles. Did you believe this was extra or minimal? And based on that correlation with the what defines a type of surgery is where I make my final call if calling it just minimally or if it's calling macroscopic. The question regarding calling microscopic, that's still going to be an intracellular variability issue because that's just intrinsic to the practice of pathology. Um, so th that I think we won't be able to go away with that the, the, that problem in, in for the micro. For in terms of macro, we can get away in terms of correlating that with the with our surgeons. Um, am, can, uh, am I? I'm not muted. Yeah, go ahead. So let's take Nifty P for an example. Okay, so Nifty P is a relatively new um, entity, and there've been many articles already devoted to Nifty P, and um, the authors who have um, who basically got together and wrote the justification and the description for NIPDP did an excellent job in giving guidelines for how to recognize NIPDP. So there's already um, uh, a way forward to um, hopefully ensure greater concordance between uh, pathologists. There's no reason um, why these kinds of these kinds of issues can't be dealt with in a, in a consensus sort of way to come up with um, guidelines for other pathologists in terms of what is, what, what do we, or how can we guide other pathologists to recognizing microscopic ETE? Um, 
so now uh, back to your question mark um I, I put a lot of extra details into my pathology report um and one reason is so that i can collect all this data and actually ask these questions so and, and then another reason is to try to kind of paint a picture with words with as few words as possible about what this particular tumor looks like so i will routinely classify the degree of microscopic um uh, ete and and i'll also sub subclassify it so it's usually in the perithyroid soft tissue um, i might see one focus in the strap muscle it's when i see multiple foci in strap muscle um when i um when that's the issue and that's really when i should be discussing this with my surgeons. Um, on the other hand, I also hope and expect that um, my surgeons get back to me and tell me, well, you know, this is really T4. And there are some times that, you know, I can't tell just based on what the tissue is labeled that it's a T4. So I hope on the other side, if I don't call something a T3, but the surgeon is, you know, convinced it is a T3, I get the feedback from them too. So it, it really works both ways. So just another, just, can I just ahead, make Juan. a comment? The, the other thing is like, you know, the ATA guidelines just have multiple uh, criteria to stratify the, a tumor as intermediate or high risk, right? So that's another thing that comes in, in terms of discussion at, at a multidisciplinary setting. For example, if I have a one centimeter tumor, with no adverse histological features. All lymph nodes are negative. The resection has clear margins. And then the only adverse feature is a minimal extrathyroidal extension. That completely changed the game compared to a case that in addition have positive lymph nodes or tall cell variant. So it's seeing the entire case in, uh, in complete is not just paying attention just to one histological feature but to see in the entire context of how the tumor is growing and this is another thing that comes more in the multidisciplinary discussion at time of tumor board oh the only reason of upgrading this risk is because of the extrathyroid extension that's a little bit different when you have other adverse features so and that's another thing that comes in in, in tumor boards every time so I think that's a valid point. I think um, in some respects, one of the concerns that I have is the assumption that all surgeons will agree as to what constitutes um, gross involvement, extrathyroidal, of, of extrathyroidal involvement. Um, and some of the inherent um, variability associated with um, a tumor arising within a gland that has Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which has an inflammatory component. And so we may be lulled or fooled into um, taking um, some strap muscle under those circumstances. Um, so, you know, I think what you're sort of doing, I mean, I think there are some situations where it's black and white um, uh, from a surgeon's perspective, but there's some inherent variability there um, from a surgeon's per, um, interpretation of what they're finding grossly in the operating room. Um, so, um, before I, I want to just, um, Dr. Smith has raised the question of whether or not um, there is a, a clinical difference with respect to risk of recurrence for focal versus um, established minimal ETE, um, uh, less than or greater than two areas of minimal ETE. So I think the question really harkens back to whether or not if you just see this in one in one location versus multiple locations, um, do we have evidence to support that that's clinically relevant? Either Margie or Juan or well, Dominic? Sure, I'll, I'll take this. So in the, in the Revere article, that's a very good question. I'd like to be able to answer that question myself too. In the Revere article, they, again, it came down to numbers. So they only had um, 20 patients that were classified as micro ETE and 31 patients that were uh, classified as established microscopic ETE. Um, and then the pay, and then when they made that, that comparison, there were 15 patients with gross ETE and 11 patients with no ETE. So while they make that conclusion, 
Um, I think the numbers are too small to support that conclusion strongly. And um, I don't know how many cases you need to have to be able to, to make that conclusion yet. I don't know yet. And I haven't um, fully analyzed our data, but um, so I, I think the question, the, the answer is still open on that, but it's a, it's a question worth asking. Okay. Um, Juan, do you have any thoughts on that particular issue? I think that answer has not been like, like completely expanded in the literature and definitely we need more 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 information about this because I, it makes a big difference and you can see that on the slides. Sometimes it's just one little focus and the other ones is, is still microscopic but it's extensive for this way. And, and I guess yeah. that that might uh, play a role but that has not been answered yet. Yeah, I just um, I just want to add the, the way we assess um, multifocal versus versus microscopic microscopic MT is I just look at the number of slides involved, and so in my reports I'll be sure to specify um, microscopic ETE is seen in these slides uh, anteriorly in the deep aspect in the superficial aspect. So I'm doing it by, by a sort of a, a a, a larger cut point of the number of slides that are involved. Yeah, there, there's another, just following that that comment from Dr. Brown, there's another issue in terms of the extent of microscopic extrathoracal extension, and one is how many sections are, are submitted um, in terms of how big is the tumor. So if you submit the entire tumor and you are actually able to evaluate the entire interface of the tumor with the parathyroidal um, a soft tissue, then you can give a better idea of what really the extent is. But if it's just representatively submitted, we cannot make that determination. So the the, the way the tissues are sampled, it, it affects a lot and how many sections are sampled. Uh, and that's a, a, a main problem that there's no standardization of how many sections of a thyroid should be submitted. Well, actually, so, the truth is, the, the standardization regarding you know one at least one cassette per centimeter tumor. So yeah, that, that, that's um, like maybe, a, the way most people deal with. But exactly. seeing so there is when, some there is some uh, uh, degree of standardization. So let me uh, let me just get to um, another question here. There are two more, and in, uh, in the interest of time, I want to see if I can get to these. Um, Camilo has brought up the question um, that while the ATA has, um, in their last iteration, recognized that risk of recurrence was really a spectrum, not just a binary or, um, the, or uh, not, it wasn't really binary, but the ability to classify into three separate um, stratifications. And with that in mind, what the pathologists are describing here is really a spectrum of, of extrathyroidal extension that perhaps lends itself um, to more than just a binary reporting of present or absent. And with that in mind, is there a way for us to study this moving forward that would help to clarify um, this, this particular concern? Okay, um, well, well that's, that's what I'm hoping to do in, in our study. I haven't done the analysis yet, but I have um, I've uh, subclassified uh, microscopic ETE in four categories, and according and also according to the number of slides, and also according to the site, if it's superficial versus deep or both. Okay, and uh, Dr. Persky has raised the question: Is there a role with would artificial intelligence? Um, given the fact that um, pathologists uh, are not helping us entirely here, <laughs> is there a role for artificial intelligence um, that could play help us in trying to clarify this issue? That's that's a really interesting. Yeah, question. I'd like to. Uh, yeah, and I'd like to address that. Um, uh, let me tell you who the man behind the curtain is when it comes to artificial intelligence and pathology. The appeal of artificial intelligence to pathology is the fact that um, vision science tries to replicate what a pathologist does. So as we heard um, in, I think it was last week's um, uh, tumor uh, club, where you have the um, clinician, the doctor in loop, 
in terms of determining um, what Im you know what images are likely to look like what right um, good design in a pathology artificial intelligent type of project we use the pathologist in the loop so the pathologist is the man behind the curtain if you ever tried to take the pathologist away from developing AI algorithms you'd get garbage <laughs> okay um, and Dr. Davies I think this is our last question that we have time for has raised the concern that we have not included um, any mutational analysis in a discussion here. Um, and so while this does is brought into the ATA risk of recurrence stratification, um, I, it's not, you have not, how would you incorporate this in perhaps um, extrathyroidal uh, extension discussion here? Well, um, you'd write a really good grant and get a lot of money and do um, and and look for loss of heterozygosity as well as known G mutations uh, in a large study and combine that with uh, AI techniques. I don't know if that answered Dr. Davies' question, but perhaps he can help us with that large branch here. So, um, listen, I think in the interest of time, um, and I've got some telemedicine. I really want to thank. This has been really fascinating. Um, I don't know if we have left, if we've come away with clarity or further confusion, and that's um, important uh, at the end of this. Um, I, you know, I, I do. Perhaps the end note on this should be the answer the question, which I don't think I answer. What the clinician should be asking their pathologist. Um, as it relates to ETE. What is, and, and how concordant is their interpretation with established guidelines, which seemingly um, are lacking? So, you know, again, this is really because at the end of the day, it's looking at that TAP report and then looking the patient in the eye and saying, this is what you have and this is what how it's going to influence my recommendation. So if you guys could just end on that note, um, I think that would be really helpful. Sure, Juan, you want to take this away? Uh, yeah, I, I think a, a major uh, problem in this is that w many pathologists don't know their impact, the clinical impact of their calls by not being aware of their of the clinical guidelines, for example. And in terms of of thyroid cancer, the more you're involved with your clinical team, with the surgeons and the endocrinologists. I think the more consistent you become with your reports, because then you know what they are really expecting. And at least that has been a, an advantage in, in our practice. We work very closely with bo both our surgeons and an endocrinologists when it comes to the risk stratification of these patients. So working together, I think that's, that's the best way of standardizing and having consistency in, the, in pathology reports. Great. Margie, do you have anything else to add? No, I, I agree with that. I think um, basically, you know, um, you have, Mark, you personally have a feel for what I mean when I am calling things. And if you don't, you ask me. And I think that's sort of the model for any, you know, inter interconnected head and neck group. It, it comes down to that, that um, you know, one word communication. All right. Um, listen, I want to thank everybody for joining us. I particularly want to um, thank our speakers. This has been awesome. And um, invite everybody to Journal Club next week. I'll be getting you, we will be getting you the topic, the articles, and uh, look forward to an exciting discussion. Again, if, if you want to please mention to your colleagues who were unable to join us that this will be hosted um, as uh, something that they can review come Monday. Um, and we'll send out further notification about that. But thanks once again. Everybody stay safe and have a great day. Yep. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you.